Right, okay. Let's take a look at the questions. One, why do you think Captain Wentworth's removing Walter from Anne makes her perfectly speechless? Two, Louisa says that Mary has a great deal too much of the Elliot pride. Do you agree? Why or why not? Three, or sorry, if so, like if you agree, can you give some examples? Three, Anne thinks that Captain Benwick is younger than I am, younger in feeling, if not in fact, younger as a man. Do you agree? Why, why not? And might there be someone who is older than Anne in this sense? Why or why not? Like older in feeling, whatever that means. Or how would you describe Anne's understanding of the uses of poetry and prose? Uh, Do you agree? Why or why not? Five. Anne hopes that Louisa's accident will prompt Captain Wentworth to reconsider the absolute value of having firmness of character in terms of Anne versus Louisa. Do you think such a comparison might make sense? Why or why not? So this what this question means is um, we will see later that uh, Wentworth uh, regrets the fact that Louisa has such a firmness of character that she is so firm in her personality that she would keep jumping off the stairs and therefore have an accident. Anne thinks about this in terms of her past relationship with Wentworth. The idea being that uh, she was persuaded to call off the engagement. She was not firm in keeping the engagement. So with Louisa's accident and Wentworth thinking about firmness of character like this, she's hoping that he might reconsider whether it is indeed good always to have firmness of character. And she's thinking about this by comparing Louisa to herself. Do you think that makes sense? to compare it like this. OK, let's look at question one. So what's going on in this scene? Um, we start. Here one morning, this is at the near the top of page 53. Uh, for those of you who are looking at your paper handouts. Uh, one morning very soon after the dinner at the Musgroves, at which Anne had not been present, so they went to Charles's parents' house. They call it the mansion or the big house to have dinner. Uh, Anne didn't go because Wentworth would be there. So after that, Captain Wentworth walked into the drawing room at the cottage where were only herself, Anne, and the little invalid Charles who was lying on the sofa. So the little Charles is Charles's son. Okay, so you have Charles Musgrove and Mrs. Musgrove. Their child is, or their children are Charles, uh, Henrietta and Louisa. The second Charles marries Mary. Elliot, uh, Anne's sister, and their children, one of them is called Charles. So in this family, there are three men called Charles. So the little Charles is the kid. He is sick. That's what this means, invalid. It, as an adjective, it's pronounced invalid, and it means unacceptable. But as a noun, it's pronounced invalid and it just means sick. So this is the scene. Anne and the sick kid are in the drawing room alone together and Wentworth walks in. The surprise of finding himself almost alone with Anne Elliot deprived his manners of their usual composure. So composure is like knowing how to handle himself, knowing what to do. 
prepared, organized. But this surprise uh, left him without his composure. Deprive means take away. He started. This does not mean begin. Start means uh, to jump in surprise or like to react with surprise. He started and could only say, I thought the Miss Musgroves had been here. Henrietta and Louisa. Mrs. Musgrove, uh, so Charles's mother, told me I should find them here. So notice he doesn't say good day, good afternoon. He doesn't say how is young Charles. No manners. He's so surprised that he could only think to explain himself. To explain why he's there. And that's all he says before he walked to the window to recollect himself. Sorry, to recollect himself. And feel how he ought to behave. To collect oneself means to gain composure. To recollect means to regain composure. Uh, but it, so I pronounce this recollect, but if you pronounce it recollect, it just means remember, as in recollection, which means memory. So pronounce it differently, it means different things. And notice he doesn't think about how he should behave. He feels how he ought to behave. His feelings are disturbed and confused. They are upstairs with my sister, Mary. They will be down in a few moments, I dare say. Uh, I dare say here simply means uh, I'm not sure, but this is what I believe. So by saying it, I'm taking a small risk. So I dare to say this. Had been Anne's reply in all the confusion that was natural. So not only is Wentworth confused, Anne is also confused. Her feelings are confused. Uh, so she also doesn't uh, say the polite thing. Instead, she simply answers his question. And if the child had not called her to come and do something for him, she would have been out of the room the next moment and released Captain Wentworth as well as herself to release them from this awkward situation. He continued at the window, <laughs> which is just a very funny way of saying he didn't move away from the window. And after calmly and politely saying, I hope the little boy is better, was silent. So he finally remembers how to be polite. She was obliged, so she had to, to kneel down by the sofa and remain there to satisfy her patient. Uh, kneel means to get on your knees. And thus the uh, patient is, of course, someone who is sick. And thus they continued a few minutes when to her very great satisfaction, she heard some other person crossing the little vestibule. Uh, so crossing the a vestibule is a small space in the house. Uh, so I guess in this house, outside of the drawing room, there is a small space uh, like an like a today we might call this a foyer, a welcome space, a space to greet people. Uh, so she hears people coming in. She hoped on turning her head to see the master of the house. So uh, that would be uh, Charles Musgrove, uh, Mary's husband. But it proved to be one much less calculated for making matters easy. So the appearance of this person makes things even more difficult. Charles hate her. This is the dude who Henrietta was going to marry before Wentworth appeared. Probably not at all better pleased by the sight of Captain Wentworth than Captain Wentworth had been by the sight of Anne. So just as when Wentworth saw Anne, he was not pleased. He's not made happy. In the same way, when Charles Hayter saw Wentworth, he also was not happy. Probably. 
uh, because at this time Henrietta is falling in love with Wentworth. She only attempted to say, how do you do? Will not you sit down? The others will be here presently. Presently means soon. So that's all she tried to say, the bare minimum of being polite. Captain Wentworth, however, came from his window, apparently not ill disposed for a conversation. So he's not averse to, he's not going to refuse to talk to Charles Hayter. But Charles Hayter soon put an end to his attempts by seating himself near the table and taking up the newspaper. And Captain Wentworth returned to his window. <laughs> Wentworth, you do Another minute brought another addition, so someone else entered. The younger boy, a remarkable, stout, forward child of two years old. So this is the second ch uh, boy child of Charles and Mary, the younger brother. He's stout, which means uh, strong. Forward, which means like he's not shy. He's open and aggressive, something like that. Two years old. Having got the door open for him by someone without. Without means outside. So someone outside helped to open the door for him because he's only two. He can't reach the door or he can't like push open the heavy door or something. Made his de determined appearance among them. So he walked in with the sense that he must let everybody know that he is here. It is a determined, full of determination appearance. And went straight to the sofa to see what was going on. Uh, and put in his claim to anything good that might be giving way. So immediately he goes to the sofa to see if there's anything fun. There being nothing let to be eat. Uh, of course, we today we would say eaten. Uh, at the time, eat was still its own past participle. There being nothing to be eaten, he could only have some play. And uh, so remember, right? Charles's kids love to eat cake because of Mrs. Musgrove. So since there's nothing to eat, he could only try to play. And as his aunt would not let him tease his sick brother, his aunt is Jane. Oh, sorry. Uh, Anne. Because uh, his mother is Mary, so Anne is his aunt. Would not let him tease his sick brother to tell kind tell no. Uh, one no. Today we spell this with an S. Uh, therefore, he began to fasten himself upon her, so he grabbed onto Anne as she knelt in such a way that busy as she was about Charles, she could not shake him off. She spoke to him, ordered, entreated, which means asked, and insisted in vain. We'll once she did contrive to push him away, so once she did succeed, contrive here means to succeed, to push him away, but the boy had the greater pleasure in getting upon her back again directly. So she tries to get him off. She succeeds once, but as soon as the kid gets pushed off, he jumps right back onto her back. Remember, because she's kneeling on the floor. Walter said she get down this moment. OK, so the guy, the kid's name is Walter. You are extremely troublesome. I am very angry with you. Walter cried Charles Hayter. Remember, cry does not mean to to sob to to like uh, and it was cool and it does not mean to shout. It just means to speak with emotion and energy. Walter cried Charles Hayter. Why do you not do as you are bid? Uh, today we would say as you are told. Putinghua, to do as you are told. Do not you hear your aunt speak? Come to me, Walter. Come to cousin Charles. Uh, so Charles Hayter is also a distant 
a family member of the Musgroves. I think earlier in the novel it explains that Mrs. Musgrove's sister is Charles Hayter's grandmother or mother. Is that right? Anyways, he's uh, either a, a cousin or a distant cousin, something like that. Uh, it, it, Mrs. Musgrove's sister is Charles Hayter's grandmother. Something like that. Um, so he's a cousin, he's a family member. Uh, but not a bit did Walter stir. Stir means move. So Walter didn't move away because of what Anne is saying or what Charles Hayter is saying. So this is the situation when Wentworth removes Walter from Anne. In another moment, however, she found herself in the state of being released from him. State here means situation or condition, zhuang tai. So like if we translate this into Chinese, literally it means 下一刻,然而下一刻,他发现自己处在被他释放的状态中. Someone was taking him from her, though he had bent down her head so much. This he is Walter. Walter had bent down her head so much that his little sturdy hands were unfastened from around her neck. Uh, right, so someone removes Walter from her and from her back, from around her neck. And he was resolutely borne away. Uh, if you can't tell, this is B-O-R-N-E, born, which is the past of the word, uh, past participle, past participle of the word bear, which means carry. Yes, uh, so he was carried away. Bef uh, we still use this word today. Uh, and before she knew, before she knew that Captain Wentworth had done it. So this tells us everything happened very fast for her. Uh, the kid was still grabbing onto her, wouldn't move. Uh, and then suddenly he is released. She is released. Uh, and only after this does she realize it must have been uh, Wentworth who released her, who, who, who took him away, carried him away, I guess. Her sensations on the discovery made her perfectly speechless. Here, sensations means emotions, feelings. So she's feeling so much she can't talk. Why? Well, first of all, of course, it means that Wentworth was very near her body, right? He came very close in order to pick him up. But also, like, in the scene, Anne is talking, Charles Hayter is talking, Wentworth doesn't say anything. And yet he is the person who goes and picks up the kid. So it's very surprising, like, she didn't expect that he would do this. And there's one other reason. Um, that the the novel will tell us a bit later. Um, actually, here I'll, I'll jump jump uh, directly to it. Uh, Charles Hayter. Says. To Captain Wentworth. You ought to have, or to Walter, you ought to have minded me, Walter. You should have listened to me. I told you not to tease your aunt. Uh, and Hayter, or sorry, and Anne could comprehend Charles Hayter regretting that Captain Wentworth should do what he, Charles Hayter, ought to have done himself. The idea is that Charles Hayter is family. So when your kid gets annoying, it is the job of the family member, not the guest, to solve this problem. So what Wentworth does is kind of, over, it's 
it's not overstepping, right? It's not his fault. But what it implies is that this family is so out of control that they can't even control their own family members. Which in this case is true. But it does make uh, Charles Hader look bad. Um, so this is also part of what Anne is feeling at this moment. The question why? OK, that's why. Uh, so like her former fiance gets very close to her without saying a word. And in this already very awkward situation where nobody likes anybody else in this room, saves her without saying anything. And then uh, by doing so also insults the other guy in the room. So this is very emotionally confusing. Uh, let's now that we have the answer, we can like slowly work through the rest of this paragraph. Uh, made her perfectly speechless. She could not even thank him. So confused, she can't even say thank you. She could only hang over little Charles, the sick one, with most disordered feelings. His kindness in stepping forward to her relief. Uh, to relieve her, Ranha Jian Qing Fudan. The manner, so the way that he did this. The silence in which it had passed. The little particulars of the circumstance, so all the little details of this circumstance. With the conviction soon forced on her. By the noise he was studiously making with the child that he meant to avoid hearing her thanks. So now what's happening is he brings the child back. He brings Walter back and he's making a lot of fuss with Walter and it's a lot of fuss. It's a lot of noise and this tells Anne that he doesn't want to hear her. Thank you. Uh, and this also tells her he rather sought to testify to prove to show that her conversation was the last of his wants. The last thing he would want to do is to talk to Anne. So he's he doesn't want to hear her say thank you because that might start a conversation. All of these details produced such a confusion of varying but very painful agitation. Uh, as she could not recover from till enabled by the entrance of Mary and the Miss Musgroves to make over her little patient to their cares and leave the room. So she's so confused, she doesn't know what to do until Mary and uh, Henriette and Louisa, the Miss Musgroves, plural, right? More than one. Henrietta and Louisa, they come in. She can hand over little Charles to their care. And then leave the room quite all. So the entrance of Mary and Miss Musgroves enabled her to do this. Let her do this. She could not stay. It might have been an opportunity of watching the loves and jealousies of the four. So here she's talking about Henrietta, Louisa, Wentworth, and Charles Hayter. Right? Louisa and Henrietta love Wentworth. Uh, Wentworth apparently loves uh, Henrietta or Louisa. Charles Hayter loves Henrietta. Henrietta used to love Charles Hayter. Uh, now Henrietta is in love with Wentworth, but Wentworth can only choose one of the two sisters. So those two sisters are also competing with each other for Wentworth. It's all very confusing, like a good romance plot should be. Um, so she would have enjoyed watching them like deal with this situation. They were now all together. But she could stay for none of it. It was evident that Charles Hayter was not well inclined toward Captain Wentworth. To be well inclined towards means to like. She had a strong impression of his having said in a vexed tone of voice. After Captain Wentworth's interference. Uh, this line we just talked about. Uh, 
Notice she says she doesn't say that he said. Uh, the novel doesn't say that Charles Hader said. The novel says that Anne had a strong impression that he said. So like. She is so confused inside that she cannot tell whether he actually did say this. It only feels like he probably did say it. And he said it in a vexed tone of voice. Uh, vexed today we would spell V E X E D. And it means troubled or annoyed. Uh, so his voice sounded very troubled or annoyed when he said this. Uh, skipping to skipping what we just talked about. But neither Charles Hayter's feelings nor anybody's feelings could interest her till she had a little better arranged her own. So she has to make sense of her own feelings first before she cares about other people's feelings. She was ashamed of herself, quite ashamed of being so nervous, so overcome by such a trifle. Trifle means unimportant thing. Team also and P. Johnson. But so it was. Uh, so even though she was ashamed, this is what happened. It's the truth. It was so. It was like this. And it required a long application of solitude and reflection to recover her. So this use of application is kind of like how you would talk about uh, external medicine, medicine that you put on the skin, right? So apply this uh, ointment, yoga, or apply this bandage, bong uh, dai. So here, what she's applying is solitude by being by herself and reflection, thinking about it. And it doesn't say, but she's applying these to her heart. And it took a long time to do this, uh, doing this in order for her to recover. That's question one. Do you want to uh, add your ideas? OK, let's go to question two. Elliot Pride. Uh, so the scene here is they have gone as a family and Wentworth. Everybody has gone on the long walk across the country. Uh, they have stopped at the top of the hill, uh, just deciding whether to uh, visit Charles Hayter or uh, to go a different direction or to turn back. Uh, and so they're stuck here. They don't have they don't know what to do. So some people have sat down and. Uh, Wentworth and. Which one Henrietta? Have gone to pick nuts. Because they're bored and as they pick nuts, they are chatting and Anne overhears them chatting. Uh, Sorry, not Henrietta, it's Louisa. He's talking with Louisa, right? Uh, yes, Captain Wentworth and Louisa. Uh, it says on page 58. Um, and then um, part of what Anne overhears is them talking about Mary. Let's see, where is it? Here, yes. So Louisa says, uh, remember, Louisa is Charles's younger sister. So she is Mary's sister in law. Uh, Mary is good natured enough in many respects, said she. Respect here means aspects, Fang Mian. But she does, uh, we still use this word today. But she does sometimes provoke me excessively. 
effigy will by her nonsense and her pride, the Elliot pride. She has a great deal too much of the Elliot pride. And so my question is, do you agree? If yes, what are some examples? So the Elliot pride is the idea that we saw from Sir Walter, which is that being an Elliot is one of the best things you can be. All right, it's very narcissistic and vain. Is Mary like that? Uh, well, we have seen from last week that she often likes to think that she's not well in order to get other people's attention. Uh, so kind of very like self-centered in this way. And then uh, in this very scene earlier, when they first sit down, uh, she also behaves in a very merry kind of way. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, I'm going to search for it. There we go. This is on page 58. Mary, finding a comfortable seat for herself on the step of a stile. A stile is a part of a gate that you can step over or you can open. Uh, this word we have preserved in the English word turnstile. A turnstile is the uh, gate of a subway station. Zaman. It's called it a turnstile because originally a turnstile is supposed to turn. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, but the Taipei Metro used to have gates that actually turned uh, and later were replaced by gates that opened and closed. Uh, anyway, she Mary found herself a seat on the step of a stile and was very well satisfied so long as the others all stood about her. So she is happy when she's the only person sitting. But when Louisa drew Captain Wentworth away to try for a gleaning of nuts, gleaning just means picking. Um, picking from common property. So it's not stealing. The tree doesn't belong to anyone. Uh, in an adjo adjoining hedgerow, I shoot home. Adjoining just means nearby. Uh, like the hedgerow is touching wherever there's. Uh, I think it's touching the fence where Anne is sitting. So it's adjoining, it's joining the two. Uh, and they were gone by degrees quite out of sight and sound. By degrees means gradually. So gradually, uh, Mary could not see them, could not hear them. Mary was happy no longer. She quarreled with her own seat. So she found her own seat annoying. To quarrel means to argue. This is a very funny way of saying she complained about her, her own seat. She was sure that Louisa had got a much better seat somewhere. Uh, simply because she, she can't see her, therefore she suspects that Louisa has found a much better seat. And nothing could prevent her from going to look for a better seat also. So she's happy when she's the only person sitting, but when she's sitting, she has to have the best seat. Yeah, that seems like a bit of the Elliot pride. Uh, and later on, she also talks about Charles Hayter and says that he's not a good enough match for Henrietta. Uh, let's see. Here in this paragraph, she's talking about Charles Hayter. Is she talking about Charles Hayter? Sorry, no, it's earlier in this chapter, uh, but she does complain about how Charles Hayter is not rich. He's not royal, and so like. Uh, Henrietta shouldn't marry him. 
Let's see if we can find this. Hang on. Uh, Here, page 51. Uh, so Charles, Mary's husband, uh, likes Captain Wentworth. They're, they're talking about Henrietta, who Henrietta should marry. Um, and so Mary thinks that Charles Hader, his pretensions should be put an end to. A pretension, this comes from the uh, word pretend. The word pretend did not originally mean make believe, like believe in something false. Pretend originally meant to try to win a position, usually the king, uh, or usually someone trying to become king. Uh, so uh, for example, if after a king dies, and the king has no son, and therefore there's more than one person who could become king. All of those people are called pretenders to the throne. Uh, throne is Wang Wei. So they are all trying to win the throne. So here Charles Hader is trying to win Henrietta, but Mary uh, poses him. She thought it would be quite a misfortune and here she explains why. Uh, here, who is Charles Hayter? Nothing but a country curate. A curate is an assistant to a vicar or a preacher uh, in the church. And it's in the country, not even in the city. A most improper match. Uh, and when her husband replies saying, no, it would be OK. One of the reasons he gives is that Charles Hayter is the eldest son. Whenever my uncle dies, he steps into very pretty property. So yes, Charles Hayter may not have money now, but once uh, someone older dies, he will inherit money and property. Uh, and remember, like he's a relative. So here, uh, Charles Musgrove is saying my uncle, uh, which is Charles Hayter's closest relative. So Mary doesn't like Charles Hayter because he's a commoner. He doesn't have money currently, and his job is a very low job. Assistant to a preacher, not even a preacher. So yeah, those are some examples of uh, Mary's Elliot pride. The idea that it is very valuable and important to be an Elliot. Questions? Okay, let's move on to three. In this scene, they have gone to Lyme and they are visiting with Captain Harville, who is Captain Wentworth's old friend. And at Captain Harville's place, he has a guest named Captain Benwick. Uh, and then we get an introduction to Benwick. on page 65. He, Benwick, had been engaged to Captain Harville's sister and was now mourning her loss. They had been a year or two waiting for fortune and promotion, so they were waiting for Benwick to make some money before getting married. Fortune came, but his prize money as lieutenant being great. Uh, lieutenant is Saul Wei. In British English, this is pronounced lieutenant. 
American English, we say lieutenant, they say lieutenant. Uh, as a lieutenant, he made a lot of money. And also promotion too came at last. So this is in italics, 学体制, which is emphasis. And this is emphasizing just how long he had to wait. Promotion came at last. But Fanny Harville did not live to know it. She had died the preceding summer, so the summer before, while he was at sea. Captain Wentworth believed it impossible for man to be more attached to woman than poor Henwick had been to Fanny Harville, or to be more deeply afflicted suffering under the dreadful change. Bianqua. A uh, dreadful means terrible. He considered his disposition uh, as of the sort which must suffer heavily. This is Benwick. Uh, disposition, disposition means fate. So he believed that his fate mean, uh, meant he had to suffer. Uniting, uh, sorry, not, not fate. Disposition here means character, personality. Uniting very strong feelings with quiet, serious, and retiring manners. So his manners, his behavior, is quiet, serious, and retiring here means inward, interior, kind of shy. So he has strong feelings, but he's quiet and shy. Uh, yes, that does make for a recipe of lots of angst and suffering. And a decided taste for reading and sedentary pursuits. Decided here means that it is firm, it is strong. He has a strong taste for reading, he likes to read. And other uh, activities, pursuits here means ha uh, hobbies, that don't require movement. Sedentary means sitting, like sitting down. So like I right now am sedentary. I'm sitting down looking at this PowerPoint uh, PDF talking to you. So this is the kind of person Benwick is suffering, quiet, emotional, likes to read, doesn't like to move a lot. Uh, to finish the interest of the story, this is kind of funny. This line is Jane Austen talking to us. Like she, she knows that she's explaining Benwick's story to us. It's not part of what happens in the story, right? This is background. So she's saying, OK, OK, I'll get to the point. I'll get the interest of the story. Like, why are we listening to this? OK, OK, I'll tell you why this is important. The friendship between him and the Harville seemed, if possible, augmented, which means strengthened by the event, which closed all their views of alliance. The event which closed all their views of alliance. Translated into modern English, this means the event that ended all their hopes of being united through marriage. In other words, Fanny's death. After Fanny dies, that's the event, they no longer had hope. They had closed their views. Views here means hope of alliance. Alliance here means connection through marriage. So the thing that ended their hope of actually being connected as family made their friendship even stronger. And Captain Benwick was now living with them entirely. And they're living by the sea. So that's the background. Uh, and now let's get to the question part. Wait, do I have the right page? 60. Yeah, 65. Uh, Actually, yeah, we're, we're almost there. Let's keep going. Uh, I was now living with them entirely. Captain Harville had taken his present house, which means his current house, for half a year. So Harville is not, does not own his house. He's also renting his house. Had taken his present house for half a year. 
uh, his taste and his health and his fortune. So what he wants, what's good for his health and how much money he has all directing him to a residence on expensive and by the sea. So it doesn't cost a lot, so he doesn't have that much money and it's by the sea, which is what he likes and what's good for him. And the grandeur of the country. So like the spectacle, like a drunk one. Uh, the country here means the neighborhood, the area. And the retirement of Lyme in the winter. So uh, yeah, in the winter. Uh, um, it's a great place to be. Appeared exactly adapted to Captain Benwick's state of mind. So it, like he's living with Harville, but it just so happens that this is also probably a great place for him to live somewhere that he would also want to live. State of mind is uh, The sympathy and goodwill excited towards Captain Benwick was very great. So here this means the story has excited or invoked or provoked uh, good feelings toward Captain Benwick. So what this also means is that this background that Jane Austen has been talking to us about uh, is also probably what Wentworth would tell them to explain this situation. Let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll finally get to the set the question part of this. So. Um, we have just learned about Captain Benwick's background. Now we'll get Anne's reaction. And yet, said Anne to herself as they now moved forward to meet the party. Uh, so now they're actually going to meet Harville and Benwick. He has not perhaps a more sorrowing heart than I have. Uh, sorrowing, I guess here means sad, sad heart than I have. I cannot believe his prospects so blighted forever. Prospect here means chances of marriage. Blight is a kind of disease that affects plants. So if a plant is blighted, then it dies. Or like if a crop is blighted, then you cannot eat the crop. So here it means like his prospects are dead uh, forever. I cannot believe he will never get married. He is younger than I am, younger in feeling, if not in fact. Which means that he's probably older than Anne, but she says that he is younger in feeling. Younger as a man. So in terms of like relationships between men and women, he is younger. He will rally again. To rally means dong san zai qi, to come again. Uh, and be happy with another. So the question is asking, do you agree with this? That Benwick is in fact a younger in feeling. And like, first of all, what does this mean? I guess what Anne means is that she has been through more sorrow or she has uh, experienced more than Benwick in the realm of romantic relationships. Therefore, she's older in that sense. Uh, so let's compare, right? What happened to Benwick? Uh, he put off marriage with the love of his life. When he was finally ready to marry her, she died. And now he's living with his future or once future 
husband, uh, brother-in-law. What happened to Anne? Anne was going to marry somebody, but was persuaded not to marry him, so she broke it up, broke it off with him. Seven years later, the reasons for not marrying him have disappeared. He has reappeared in her life, and they both have feelings for each other. Or I guess at this moment, we from Anne's perspective, we only know that Anne has feelings for him. She's still not sure how he feels about her. So like, yes, it does seem like what Anne has been through is a bit more complicated, is a bit more, uh, has more events. And also like, Benwick can mourn Fanny for the rest of his life. But Anne cannot more cannot mourn her dead love because the object of that love has reappeared. And so like she loves him. But she does not feel like she could marry him because she thinks that he uh, despises her. Ta. That does seem to be sadder, right? That does seem to be more painful. Uh, so in like if we look at it this way, then then yes. Uh, Anne is does feel older than Benwick in terms of feeling. But you know, we can also look at it in a different way. Um, and this th the second way is not natural to these characters. It's a different kind of logic than they would use in their life. Which is as long as Wentworth and Anne are still alive, there is always a chance. And therefore Benwick suffers more because there's no way Fanny will come back to life. These characters would not think like this because the way that their society is structured is very different from our society. Remember, we live in a free democracy. Everybody has an equal chance. Supposedly, it should be. They don't. They live in an aristocracy. Where everybody's importance is determined by their family and their money. So no, not everyone has an equal chance. And if you think about it, what is family relations? What is money? They are both signs of relationships. Uh, you make you you usually can't make a fortune uh, by yourself. You unless you're like a, a, a sailor, right? In, during a war like Wentworth, usually you gain money because someone important has given you money. So that kind of fortune is also related to relationships. So it is relationships that determine people, not people who determine relationships. So in this case, the relationship between Wentworth and Anne has been broken off. They no longer have any relationship. Their relationship is a non relationship. They are prevented from any possibility precisely by the fact of their non relationship. Let me let me put it this way. The first time they met, they went from no relationship to having a relationship. But when Anne broke off their engagement, they went from having a relationship to having a non relationship. N they, things did not go back to what they used to be. They now have a history. They can't just pretend like they're strangers again. So now during at, at this point in the novel, they are stuck in this non relationship. Right, a non relationship is different from not having a relationship. A non relationship is the state of not having a relationship, but with a history of previously having a relationship, and it is that history that stands between them. So Anne would never think, oh, as long as Wentworth is alive, anything is possible. If she were a kind of very hopeful person and a romantic person, um, 
remember the novel tells us she uh, knew romance when she was young and she had to learn how to be sensible. So now she's more sensible than romantic, but if she were more romantic, she wouldn't think as long as Wentworth were alive. She would think, she would hope that something would change Wentworth's mind regarding her. Now, what kind of thing would that be? It's very hard to imagine because the facts of the case are very clear. Anne loved him, but was persuaded by someone else to give him up. There is very little room for interpretation in these events. Anne did wrong by Wentworth. That is their non-relationship. So what could possibly happen to change Wentworth's mind and make him like Anne again? To Anne, there is nothing. It's impossible. And that's why she feels that she has suffered more than Benwick. Now we know that at the end of the story, Anne and Wentworth get back together. So how is this possible? The answer is that it is because Wentworth does not actually hate Anne. Yes, she did him wrong. Yes, he was angry when he left to, to fight the war, but now he doesn't feel angry. Maybe she, he didn't feel angry at Anne. Maybe he felt angry at the situation, at the people who convinced Anne to break off the engagement, but he didn't hate Anne herself. So there is no question of him changing his mind. His mind was never changed to hate her in the first place. OK, do you have questions about this one? No. OK, thank you. Uh, let's move on to four. 67, 68. So uh, she's talking to Benwick. Um, and they're like chatting about like what they like to do. All the other people like to walk around Lyme and go sightseeing, be tourists. Uh, but Anne and Benwick both love reading, so that's what they talk about. Um, so let's start. This is page 67. Yes, so let's start uh, here. While Captains Wentworth and Harville led the talk, the conversation on one side of the room and by recurring to former days, so older days, supplied anecdotes or stories in abundance, so many stories to occupy and entertain the others. Occupy here means to take up their time to give them something to do. Entertain means to make them happy. It fell to Anne's lot, so this is what she felt she had to do. To do. Uh, lot here means uh, fate, so it fell to Anne. This is her fate. This is what she felt like she had to do. To be placed rather apart with Captain Benwick, so she and Benwick are sitting near each other away from everybody else. Uh, so this is what happened to her. That's her lot and a very good impulse of her nature, obliged her, so she felt she had to, to begin an acquaintance with him, to begin talking to him. He was shy and disposed to abstraction. So like when he's talking or thinking, he often floats off into the abstract. I'm sure you've met this kind of person, right? When you talk about something to someone, instead of saying, oh, that's wonderful, or oh, that's terrible, they say, oh, you know, that's just how life is, or oh, you know, people are just like that. Uh, this is the kind of person Benwick is. But the engaging mildness of her countenance, so uh, her expression, is very mild, so not strong, very soft and welcoming, and it's engaging, so like uh, welcoming. And gentleness of her manners, her behavior is very gentle, 
soon had their effect, and Anne was well repaid the first trouble of exertion. Exertion means effort, so her efforts paid off. So that he started talking to her. He was evidently going by the evidence of the conversation. He was evidently a young man of considerable taste in reading. Considerable uh, here means good or having a lot. Uh, today, considerable means a lot. Big. Uh, although we, we wouldn't say big taste, right? We say good taste. Uh, so he re he likes to read. He reads a lot, though principally, which means mainly in poetry. OK, uh, English lesson time. The word principally. When spelled like this, ending in AL, principal means main. It's an adjective. This is where we get the word for the head of a school because the head of a school is the main person of the school. The main person in control of that school. If you need the word meaning something, you will always defend. Renzi, that's principle ending in LE as a noun. So principle AL is an adjective meaning main, but principle LE is a noun, meaning like key value or core value. So try not to get these two confused. So here, mainly he reads poetry. And besides the persuasion, here's that word again, the persuasion of having given him at least an evening's indulgence in the discussion of subjects, uh, so here persuasion is used in the sense of uh, having an impression. She is impressed, she is persuaded by the situation and by his reaction that she has given him at least an evening's indulgence in the discussion of subjects. So she had um, uh, humored him. She has allowed him to talk about what he, to, to guide the conversation to talk about what he wants to talk about. She is persuaded or convinced that this is what has happened. Uh, and these are subjects or topics which his usual companions had probably no concern in. Uh, so she this this counts as a good deed, right? So sense to talk about something with someone that they like to talk about, but that he usually does not have the chance to talk about. That's a good deed. Uh, so aside from this, she had the hope of being of real use to him in some suggestions. So not only helping his uh, mood and keeping him company, but also giving him actually good advice and suggestions. Uh, what kind of suggestions? As to the duty and benefit of struggling against affliction. So here affliction again means his suffering. So she wants to help him understand why he should and why it is good to fight against your own sense of suffering. And these suggestions, which these suggestions had naturally grown out of their conversation. So she's not like interrupting their conversation to shove advice down his throat, right? And through the natural course of conversation, uh, she has found an opportunity to bring up this idea. Uh, for which means because though shy, he did not seem reserved. So reserved means to keep to yourself and to not be open, but here he is shy 
uh, which simply means he does not actively engage others. But if someone engages him, he responds and replies. Uh, he is not shy like all the way through. He he doesn't. He's not like very private and keeps to himself. He just doesn't like to begin conversations. Uh, so therefore, when Anne begins talking to him, they can have an actual conversation. So instead of shy, it had rather the appearance of feelings glad to burst their usual restraints. So remember, right? He has strong feelings. Uh, so the the appearance to Anne, it appears like Benwick is full of feeling and just usually does not have the chance to express his feelings. And having talked of poetry, the richness of the present age, so the richness of current poetry, this is in like 1814, something like that. And gone through a brief comparison of opinion as to the first rate poets. So they're comparing their ideas about the best poets. First rate, which means the highest rank, the best. Trying to ascertain, which means to try to figure out whether Marmion, which is a poem, or the Lady of the Lake, another poem, were to be preferred, and how ranked, so how, which one is better, the Jower and the Bride of Abydos, these are both poems, and moreover, how the Jower was to be pronounced, <laughs> right? Because when you read poetry, it's written down. So how do you pronounce this word? Is also a topic of their conversation. Uh, so like this is not just a this is like a summary of their conversation. Like they first m start out uh, from a general discussion and then they go to a particular discussion of these different poems. So after talking about all of these things, he showed himself so intimately acquainted with all the tenderest songs. A uh, song here means poet. Sorry, poem. So through this discussion, it is revealed that Benwick is very familiar with these poems of one poet and all the impassioned descriptions of hopeless agony. Wang de Bei Sang Bei Tong of the other, and this is referring to the author of these poems. Um, the footnotes give us their names, Sir Walter Scott and Lord Byron. These are both very famous authors. Uh, Walter Scott was actually better known for writing Gothic novels, which are like an earlier form of horror fiction. Gothic novels focus a lot on like uh, scary places, uh, unnatural relations like incest or like rape or like psychos, that kind of novel, and they're usually historical novels. Byron, Byron is one of the most famous poets of the Romantic uh, period, uh, and he's famous. Actually, he's more he's famous because of his poetry, which is about uh, as as it says here, hopeless the impassioned descriptions of hopeless agony. Uh, so his characters are often men who are who feel like they are doomed and nothing can save them. But he's also famous for being a very, very uh, prominent womanizer. He was very good at seducing women. Uh, so those are the two poets. And he's very familiar with these two poets and their work, and their work is always about the emotion, right? Tenderness, xing, and agony, Beitong. Benwick repeated with such tremulous feeling. Tremulous is the adjective for tremble, to shake. So like his voice is shaking because of how deeply he feels these poems. He repeated the various lines which imaged a broken heart. Now today we don't use the word image as a verb. If you want to say xiang xiang, you must say imagine. 
想象力 is imagination. Image is 意象 or 形象 So here the exact meaning of this is these lines of poetry perfectly give the description and image of a broken heart. Or a mind destroyed by wretchedness. Wretchedness here means suffering. So such deep suffering that destroys the mind. Today we would call that trauma. And looked so entirely as if he meant to be understood. So like he's trying to make Anne understand how he feels by reading and repeating these lines of very uh, um, deeply emotional poetry. That she ventured to hope, to venture here means to suggest in conversation. To hope that he did not always read only poetry. And to say that she thought it was the misfortune of poetry to be seldom safely enjoyed by those who enjoyed it completely. Seldom means rarely. So in plain English, this means that it's too bad. Poetry is often not enjoyed safely by those who enjoy it completely. In other words, most of the time, people who really, really love poetry face some kind of danger from this poetry. Very interesting. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, actually, well, let's keep going because the idea comes out later. Uh, and that the strong feelings which alone could estimate it truly. Today we don't say estimate. Today, today we say esteem. And esteem simply means value or evaluate. Uh, so the strong feelings that alone could tell you it's the true value of poetry were the very feelings, the same feelings, which ought to taste it but sparingly. So if you have strong feelings, you should only read poetry once in a while. That's what sparingly means, not a lot, just a little. So there's some kind of danger connected with having strong feelings and then reading poetry. Uh, and th this is also connected with uh, what she wants to do. She wants to suggest that he should struggle against suffering. And then you also have the idea here, right? That uh, minds can be destroyed by suffering. So apparently the danger of reading poetry when you have strong feelings is that your feelings might be strengthened and made stronger uh, until they overwhelm you and you can't handle them and it breaks your mind and you go crazy. Something like that. Uh, of course, it doesn't have to be all of a sudden. People might slowly grow weaker and weaker uh, when encountering difficult situations or when they're trying to deal with their own emotions, they might be less and less able to deal with their emotions. So this is the kind of danger that Anne is talking about. So she made this suggestion. The word venture, today we usually see this in the phrase venture capitalist or venture capitalism. Uh, or, you know, VC for short. These are people with a lot of money and they invest in ideas for new companies that they think will become bigger companies and make back their money. Uh, so they go on a venture. This word is related to adventure, right? Motion. A venture is something that you try. An adventure is a good experience. So it's not exactly the same, but the idea is similar. There's a risk. So <clears throat> she has tried to make this suggestion, and then we get Benwick's response. His looks, so his expression, 
showing him not pain, so he doesn't feel like it's an insult. His facial expression does not make it seem like he has been insulted. But instead pleased with this allusion to his situation. So hearing and talk about his situation. Allusion to make reference to in se. Uh, hearing and talk about his situation actually makes him happy. Makes him feel like somebody does understand him. She was emboldened to go on. Uh, the word bold, right? So emboldened means to gain courage. To continue. And feeling in herself the right of seniority of mind. She thinks of herself as older in feeling, so she has seniority. To be senior to him. In her mind, uh, not her mind in terms of mental age. So feeling that she has this right as an older person, she again ventured to recommend a larger allowance of prose in his daily study. So he should read more prose. Allowance today we usually use this to mean money that you give a child. Ling uh, Yongqian. But it, it comes from the word allow, right? You should allow yourself to read more po uh, prose is what she's saying. And on being requested to particularize. Uh, particularize means to give details. Uh, the related more common phrase is in particular, which means in detail or specifically. So to particularize means to give particulars, to give details or specific items. So when he asked her, OK, well, what should I read? She mentioned such works of our best moralists. A moralist is someone who uh, expounds on what is good and what is bad. This is not very popular anymore today, but if this used to be a big thing where people would write essays and books explaining what is the right thing to do, what is the wrong thing to do. So she recommended works of our best moralists, s such collections of the finest letters. So collections of letters. Uh, such memoirs of characters of worth and suffering. Uh, memoir basically means uh, autobiography. Uh, in Chinese, we call this hui yi ru. So what's the difference between a memoir and an autobiography? A memoir is about the important parts of your life that you want to talk about. An autobiography is about your entire life. So uh, the books that she's recommending are only about uh, the important parts in the life of people who are worthy and have suffered. So like these people are valuable. Their uh, experiences are valuable because they have suffered. They have been through these experiences. So if you think about it, kind of like Anne, right? She has been through these experiences, and so she thinks she has something of value to recommend to Benwick. Uh, and she doesn't have to think very much as occurred to her at that moment. And uh, she picked these out, calculated uh, for a purpose to rouse and fortify the mind. To rouse means like to give energy. Uh, fortify means to strengthen. Uh, and how how would these books do that? By the highest precepts. This is not a word we usually see today. Uh, the word precept is a moral idea. Uh, like all men are good 
it's a very general and very simple idea related to good and bad. Uh, and this is a popular way for moralists uh, to make their case. They would use specific examples, and then from those examples would come up with a precept that is supposed to be useful for the reader. Uh, right here it says the strongest examples of moral and religious endurances to endure, right? Jin yi, chen xia zhu. This is related to the suffering above. OK, so back to our question. Anne thinks of poetry as more about emotions and maybe a bit dangerous. And prose as about ideas and maybe more helpful. Does this make sense today? Well, today we don't usually have moralists. We do still have people telling stories and writing essays that can give you ideas about life. Um, but even today, when we think about those nonfiction works of prose, people often care also not just about what it says, but how the author says it. So the use of language, is it beautiful? Does it help convey the argument? So prose is also related to emotion today. Whereas on the other hand, th there are people who write poetry to share and promote ideas. It's usually not good poetry, but it does exist. So I would say that this separation makes more sense in Anne's day, uh, especially back in the early days of the novel, which of course is more about feelings and experiences. OK, questions? OK, quickly, question five. Here, so after Louisa had her accident, now there, Anne and Wentworth and Henrietta are traveling in the same carriage, Matsu. And here, when she accidentally reminds him of the accident, he says, don't talk of it, don't talk of it, he cried. Oh God, that I had not given way to her at the fatal moment. So when she asked me to catch her again, I should not have let her jump at that fatal moment. Had I done as I ought, if only I had done what I had, what I should have, which is to stop her. But so eager and so resolute, Dear sweet Louisa. So this is the part of her character that he's focused on. She's so resolute. She's firm in character. So Anne is thinking, ah, this is the thing that he blamed me for lacking in breaking uh, my engagement with him earlier. So could this accident, whether it might not strike him, may not make him think that like all other qualities of the mind, it should have its proportions and limits. And that maybe a persuadable temper, Pi uh, Chi, might sometimes be as much in favor of happiness as a very resolute character. Again, there's that word persuasion, persuadable. So from this, she's making a comparison between herself and Louisa. Do you think that makes sense? On the surface, it looks like they're talking about the same thing, right? 
whether you can get someone to change their mind. But if you think about it, it's two completely different situations. Anne is uh, talking about herself is a major life decision, marriage or not. But Louisa is a very small thing, whether to jump or not. So the way that we think about big things and little things can be very different. So perhaps this comparison does not make as much sense as Anne thinks. But that depends on whether Wentworth can see the difference. If he thinks it's the same, it could be a meaningful comparison. If he thinks they're different, that might just emphasize even more the difference between Anne and Louisa. We'll learn at the end of the novel, near the end, what he actually thinks of Louisa. For now, do you have questions about five? OK, so uh, we're almost out of time. So for before next week, please read up to chapter 16. 